And very good. We are back in class here on Monday. Hope you survived the weekend okay. August 3rd, we're starting uh, chapter 27, which is carbohydrates. We only have a couple more chapters and then uh, metabolism, citric acid cycle, and uh, yeah, so we'll be wrapping up pretty soon there. Homework 11 is due tonight. That corresponds to chapter 26. Make sure you get that done. Also, quiz eight will be due tomorrow. The off time with the uh, TAs and recitation to help out there. I also wanted to mention this supplementary book, the biochemical biological applications book. So if we've requested this from Cengage Learning, it's a combination of specific chapters that have all the organic chemistry of the biomolecules. You can get this in the bookstore. Um, and you can order it online. I think there's still time to get a hold of it if you need it. I don't assign any problems out of it. It's just more detailed discussion uh, that you'll see later on uh, when we get into metabolism and transcription, translation, some of those more biotopics that aren't covered in very much detail in your textbook right now, the Smith book. You don't have to get this. It's just uh, supplementary information. It's also useful to keep up on this material going into biochemistry, Chem 481, and uh, other classes you might have that involve uh, organic chemistry that way. So I like to mention that. All right, let's look on the overhead here and see what we've got here in Chapter 27, carbohydrates. Yeah, the sweet stuff. So finally, we're getting to carbs here. Uh, so, yeah, they're called carbohydrates for a reason. The empirical formula is every carbon has H2O associated with it. Now, that's not the structure, but that's why they're called carbohydrates anyway. You've probably heard of these other terms, too. We'll look at the monocarbohydrates first, glucose, fructose. We'll get to disaccharides like sucrose. And then polysaccharides, oligosaccharides like cellulose and starch. So there's a lot of terms you've probably heard before. We'll define them systematically, of course, and we'll look at the structures with the Fisher projection, kind of like we did with the amino acids. There are aldoses and ketoses, and aldose is an aldehyde polyalcohol. So usually the C1 carbon is an aldehyde, so it's called an aldose. The O suffix refers to sugars. So kind of systematic here. Ketose, it's not an aldehyde, it's a ketone, usually at the C2 position, as we'll see with fructose. Triose means three carbons. Glyceraldehyde is a triose, shown here. Tetrose, four, pentose, and on up. Hexose is probably the most common class that includes glucose. But there are higher order sugars, heptoses, and even octoses and nanoses. Uh, that go up there. In nature, here on Earth, we have the D series sugars. So there is a bizarro world out there probably that has the L sugars, the enantiomeric form. But here on our Earth, we have the uh, D sugars in nature. Aldohexoses, and these are a few that you need to have memorized, and we'll get to the structures and help you out. If you work enough problems, you'll just keep these straight. Glucose, Okay, uh, is a hexose with four stereo centers. The pattern is right, left, right, right. And you'll see how that relates to mannose and galactose. Those uh, are also common in metabolism. We'll have you know that. Aldopentose, ribose, deoxyribonucleic acid. There it is. Ribose is based on DNA, RNA. Hexose, as I mentioned, fructose. Yeah, the stereochemistry is very important. So looking at the simplest one here. Uh, D-glyceraldehyde, uh, it's the R stereocenter right here. And the D series here just simply refers to the last stereocenter being to the right, okay? And if you assign R and S there, that stereocenter is indeed R. And if you tip it on its side, there it is in the zigzag, and you can see that stereocenter uh, right there. The other two carbons don't have stereocenters. Uh, for this aldo uh, trios, glyceraldehyde is the uh, accepted name for it. I guess you could call that, what, dihydroxypropanol. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to call it that. Uh, glyceraldehyde is the accepted name for it. It is dextrorotatory. We will look at optical rotations. That's an important topic here. Uh, when you get to five and six carbon sugars, they'll uh, be in equilibrium with their ring close form. 
the pyran ring here. And that's because an alcohol can function as a nucleophile adding to the aldehyde here. And if you tip it on its side here, we get the, what, hemiacetal. Here was the aldehyde carbon. So here's glucose, right, left, right, right, is the pattern in the Fischer projection. Four stereocenters, you can see them all uh, right there. And uh, when it cyclizes into the acetal form, you've got a new stereocenter here. We call that the anomeric carbon. Now that C1 position, that anomeric carbon is where a lot of reactivity will occur. We can oxidize or reduce there. We can also polymerize at that position and form the full acetal. And that will be important when we get to the polysaccharides. But right now you can see, you know, this is a, what a polyalcohol aldehyde. And it's this uh, C5 hydroxyl that can be the nucleophile. And here it is right here in the back. <laughs> and what else do you notice here? Chair conformations, yeah. And in glucose, all the stereocenters are in equatorial positions, uh, except for this one. We call this the alpha anomer, where the hydroxyl group is down in that position. This new stereocenter can also be in the up position. We'll have to look at that. That's called the beta form of the chair hemiacetal. Alpha is favored electronically. Beta being equatorial is favored sterically. We'll have to talk about uh, that, but because they're in equilibrium here, the free aldehyde can actually be oxidized. So we call it a reducing sugar in relation to the Tollens test. We'll have to talk about that. And plus the optical rotations of the alpha and the beta are different. And those optical rotations can equilibrate as you go back and forth between the closed form and open form, and that changes the actual rotation that you see there. So there's some factors here that come out of the structures. And again, as always, focus on the structure. That'll help you with the reactivity and the properties. These are all, of course, water soluble because they're <laughs> quite highly oxidized, right? We'll need to talk about that. Glycosides at the anomeric position have another group, not just an OH group but some other thing like an ether. And if there's an ether there, it becomes an acetal. Or you can have a nitrogen there, uh, like in DNA and RNA, the base pairs on ribose. There can be um, sulfurs and, and other groups there. And then there's alpha and beta forms for each of those, okay? Once you form the glycoside there, there's no meter rotation. The optical rotations will not change. They're stable to neutral in basic conditions. If you add acid and water and go back, you can hydrolyze the acetal. And that's just what these are, they're acetals, right? And we can uh, link them up into uh, disaccharides like maltose, cellobiose, uh, sucrose, and we'll look at those disaccharides. You can polymerize them and make things like cellulose, which has the 1,4 beta linkage. 1,4 alpha linkage uh, is, uh, is starch, uh, amylose, amylopectin and some other compounds you've probably seen. Sucrose is uh, uh, glucose fructose linked together as a disaccharide. Uh, it's one, two link, that, that sh should be a two there. <laughs> uh, because it's full acetal and there's no hemiacetal present, it's actually not meter rotating and it's a non-reducing sugar. Those will be the two key things that have to do with the optical rotation and the reactivity with the Tollens test and we'll get to that. So here's some of the reactions. We can form the full acetals with water. Uh, I'm sorry, water is a hemiacetal. An alcohol for, forms a full acetal or another sugar or some other glycoside forms the acetal there. Uh, we can make polyethers uh, if we use silver oxide as a base with methyl iodide. We can make polyesters, uh, rayon fibers out of cellulose or other Simple sugars, of course, we can put on a bunch of acetate esters. We can oxidize at C1 with the Tollens test. And this is a neat one. We've got a demo for that coming up today. When you do the oxidation with silver oxide, the byproduct is silver zero, silver in reduced form. So you'll, uh, you'll see what happens to the glassware that we do the reaction in. You can also do the oxidation with, uh, with uh, copper. And, and hydroxide or with a bromine uh, water here. That forms an aldonic acid. We can oxidize both at the C1 and the C6 position in a hexose and form what's called the aldaric acid and get a dicarboxylic acid with uh, 
with nitric acid. So some reactions here. A lot of these reagents we've seen before. The silver oxide's a new one there, though. But so here's sodium borohydride, your old friend. That'll reduce aldehydes to alcohols and make aldehydes. Cyanohydrin, yeah, that will add to the aldehydes, too. We'll look at that. We'll skip the wall degradation. Probably won't have time for that, but that clips off a carbon. Cyanohydrin uh, adds another carbon to the sugar as it forms. And that's part of the Fisher synthesis. And Emil Fisher won the Nobel Prize early 1900s for a reason. He established all of the relative stereochemistry of the simple sugars through the whole series using just cyanohydrins, reduction reactions, recrystallization, and optical rotation. He did not have IR. He did not have NMR or even X-ray analysis. He did everything by optical rotations. So some symmetry issues that we'll look at uh, for the Fisher guy here. Uh, and polysaccharides, I already mentioned a couple. We've got disaccharides coming up. And then the polys, cellulose, which is wood fiber. That's not food. We don't <laughs> digest that. We have it in our diet as roughage or fiber or whatever. That's why you eat your fruits and vegetables. You get that fiber. But that's not digested. It's not liberated as free glucose. These are just polyglucose, cellulose and starch. Starch is in plants, uh, in rice and potatoes, whatever. And uh, the difference is just this is the alpha anomer linked. It's got the down stereochemistry, whereas cellulose is equatorially linked. Uh, and that's the beta stereocenter. So big difference there between not food and food, right? <laughs> so important thing to keep straight. But it all boils down to one stereocenter, which is kind of amazing. And then, yeah, we will do DNA. We'll look at the uh, nitrogen uh, nucleosides here of uh, deoxyribose and ribose for RNA. We'll look at the ATGC, the purine pyrimidine bases, the base pairing. Uh, yeah, and we'll get into replication, show how DNA can uh, be doubled, the amount, and then how it can be uh, what transcribed into RNA and then converted into uh, protein. We will look at translation also, <laughs> uh, at least the molecular basis of it, right? So we're not going to get into all the regulation and all the cell cycles and all the uh, biochemistry of it, but the structures we will, we will cover there. All right. So why are sugars important? Well, there's so many applications, and one is, of course, a fuel. It's a renewable fuel source as opposed to the uh, fossil fuels. So if you take cellulose or wood fiber and then hydrolyze it, either with strong acid and water, you go from the acetal form, that's the linkage right here, the anomeric position, and you can get the hemiacetal or the glucose, the monosaccharide. Okay, uh, and that can be used for fuel for, for a number of things. We use it as fuel. This is blood sugar, right? It's made by photosynthesis. And here are all the steps for photosynthesis. And here's all the individual reactions involved in it. You can add them up here. And this is to take one molecule of CO2 out of the atmosphere and convert it into a carbon and a carbohydrate sugar. Now look at all the cofactors involved here. Plants really do do a lot of work here, right? Photosynthesis. So one CO2, here's the added up thing, takes a molecule of water and eight, what HVs, what are those? That's photons. That's visible light coming from the sun, driving this reaction in plants. Eight photons have to hit the plant for each uh, CO2 molecule taken in to make a carbon uh, installed into a carbohydrate. And, and water, or oxygen's a byproduct, and we rely on that too, right? <laughs> we have a symbiotic relationship with plants. So there's that reaction again. Um, you know, how much energy is that? Uh, well, it's uh, 114 kcals per mole, okay? But eight photons coming from the sun, if you use the, uh, the equation here for the energy, Planck's constant speed of light over the wavelength, the average wavelength of white light, 575 nanometer, that's 400 kcals per mole, okay, uh, of eight photons. So let's see, uh, the plant's only using 114, but there's 400 available from the sun, right? That's only 28% efficiency. So plants are great that way, but they're not harvesting all, all the photon energy they can there. And plus, once you get glucose, when you hydrolyze cellulose, you have to digest it with yeast. 
Okay, this is the fermentation process you've probably heard about. Glucose going to ethanol, actually two ethanol molecules. And this can be used as fuel. It can be burned in internal combustion engines. Uh, cars can run on this, blended with uh, gasoline. Uh, and yeah, that can give out a, a, a lot of heat. There are also other compounds that can be formed from glucose, of course. Bacteria can form acetic acid and then onto methane. And methane is, of course, natural gas that can be used as fuel. So it's a lot of applications. Of course, sugars, carbohydrates are part of the biomolecules, molecules of life. We've done amino acids. We'll do lipids later on also and DNA uh, because of the sugar right here in the middle, right? That's the deoxyribose, DNA, uh, is part of the uh, carbohydrate discussion there. So they all have different applications, different properties, uh, but the main one I think for carbohydrates is metabolism, the energy generated inside of cells, uh, also structural elements, and we'll see some other applications, of course, of uh, carbohydrates. Uh, materials, yeah, cellulose, we just mentioned that. We've already done the polyalkene polymers here, polyethylene, polystyrene. So this, these are synthetic materials. Here's natural materials. You can convert cellulose into a lot of other things. If you put ethers on here or acetate, uh, rayon fibers or whatever. Cellulose is, of course, cotton fibers. It can be processed into the fibers that go into clothing and all sorts of other uh, materials. But it's just polyglucose. <laughs> but with the beta, the up uh, position right there. Okay, other fuels there, we've talked about some of those. We'll get into this, uh, but I'm gonna go to the sideboard here in a second. Keeping track of the sugars, the ones you need to know, I like to give this right up front, glyceraldehyde, the simplest one, the triose. I'll show you erythrose and threose, you don't need to memorize those, but those are tetroses, the general idea of the classes you need to know. But you need to know the full structure of glyceraldehyde, okay? And it's in the D series. We're only looking at the D aldoses here. One stereocenter, then there's just, uh, what, two absolute isomers, the D and the L glyceraldehyde. But we're just looking at the D series. So uh, two stereocenters, there's possibility even of four. The total number of, of absolute isomers is two to whatever power the number of stereocenters, right? So two to two is four. Here's two of them. And then we have the L erythrose and l 3 os which the stereocenters are to the left or to the left and the right there. Okay. Then we've got uh, ribose. That's the important one for uh, DNA, RNA. A lot of other pentoses. Uh, and then look at how many hexoses there are. And <laughs> these are just the D ones. There's eight of them. Well, 16 total if you look at the L series. And there's glucose, right, left, right, right. Kind of sounds like marching band. You kind of skip on your uh, right foot there once or twice, whatever. Uh, and so that pattern there, you see, uh, you'll, you'll keep that straight. Don't worry about the other ones that are up there. Oh, mannose. Mannose is the epimer, or you switch the stereocenter to two position relative to glucose. You see glucose is right, left, right, right. Mannose is left, left, right, right. And galactose, right, left, left, right. So those patterns have to do with the name and, and what they can do there. And we'll, of course, get into the cyclic form. Uh, and, and yeah, we'll leave it off right there. Let's go over to the sideboard here, talk about a couple things a little more specifically about carbohydrates. And the names, the first thing, right? We've got all these different names. They all mean the same thing, <laughs> okay? Whether you want to call them carbs, <laughs> talking about, you know, diet, and what is there, four kilocalories per gram of carbs, Everybody keeps track of that nowadays, right? How many kilocalories for, for fat in the diet? Nine, yeah, you get a lot more energy out of fats. Uh, carbohydrates and, and protein is four kcals per, per gram. Saccharide is also a term to, to talk about sugars, and that's referring to the sweetness factor. Saccharin, meaning sweet, whatever, or just sugar. Uh, Sugar kind of has a bad common connotation now. Some people actually argue that sugars in the diet are toxic. Oh, I, I, I don't know how you can make that claim. Maybe too much sugar in the diet can be uh, bad for your health, of course. Uh, but taken in moderation, you need sugar to stay alive. This is blood sugar, after all. This is coursing through your veins right now as you're uh, thinking there. Here's the basic structure for glucose or any hexose. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. 
go back to the structure and look at that and count them up. And then you can reorganize this empirical formula to be C6. And then here's the elements of water and there's six of those, you see. And so that's where the term carbohydrate comes from. It's the hydrated form of carbon, which is kind of cool. And when we talk about metabolism, we're talking about combining sugars with oxygen and making what? CO2 plus water plus what? A lot of energy or heat, right? And that keeps your body temperature at 98.6. And it also provides all the energy to run reactions within living systems. So this reaction is very important here. It's about uh, 600 kcals per mole, which is a lot, a lot of energy coming out of there. Okay. Now, the term that some people confuse with carbs, carbohydrates, is, uh, is not carbohydrate, but hydrocarbon here. Hydro carbon, okay? And that's what we're not talking about. We talked about hydrocarbons in 351. And what are those? Things like hexane, right? C6H14. That's a different molecule, but it's kind of unfortunate. The name is kind of similar there. And also combustion gives the same type of products, right? CO2 and water and plus a lot of energy. Now, how much energy is it? Is it more or less than a carbohydrate when it combusts? Well, we just mentioned the energy coming out of fats, right? And fats are highly reduced, right? They have more hydrocarbon type character. You get nine kcals per mole out of a, a fat and food. So yeah, here you get like 1200 or so kcals uh, per mole. That's a huge amount, which kind of begs the question, how come nature didn't select a hydrocarbon, a more reduced form of carbon to be its energy molecule. You get out a lot more energy after all. Look, the similar thing here, uh, carbohydrate wise, you get out uh, less there, okay? Similar type of product. We know this is combustion, right? A flame, whatever, burning. Uh, you don't wanna do that in metabolism. This is uh, uh, a stepwise thing with enzymes in your body. There's no flame involved, but the overall energy is similar there. Okay, why did nature select this more oxidized form of carbon to be its energy molecule? Well, it probably has to do with control and an important thing here, carbohydrates are water soluble, okay? Uh, hydrocarbons are not water soluble and they give off too much energy, okay? So it's kind of an in-between thing here. These we say carbohydrates are partially oxidized, okay? They're not oxidized all the way, that's CO2 but you'll see the structures, a polyalcohol with an aldehyde on the, on the end carbon is only partially oxidized, whereas hydrocarbons, just all carbon and hydrogen, are fully reduced forms of carbon, right? And that's where you get more energy out. You've already got a lot of oxygens on carbohydrates, so we say they're partially uh, that way. And plus, you got the solubility, and then you got the control biochemically of that to re release that energy in a systematic way. It's beneficial to the organism. Anyway, keep, keep that in mind. I think that's an important thing for the structure there uh, to see that. Now, let's look at the basics of the key sugar being uh, glucose. In this pattern here, I like to show the structure and relate that to what we're talking about. So it is an aldehyde, right, left, right, right. And there's another alcohol, yeah, glucose. So it, yeah, count them all up. And, and there's a hydrogen here on each side. And this Fisher projection, you know, anything in the horizontal plane is, is coming out at you. And anything in the vertical plane is going back there. So we've got stereocenters one, two, three, four, okay? This one is a primary alcohol. That's not a stereocenter. Of course, the, the aldehyde itself is not. So we're going to have to look at this and how it can cyclize into this. And it occurs in this manner. And we're going to have to transfer a proton. We'll look at the mechanism of that. But it's going to have uh, this position. There's that primary alcohol still right there. And uh, there's the four position, the three position, and then the two position here. And we can have this either up or down depending on whether it's alpha or beta, but that's the, uh, the cyclic form there. And then we're not limited there. We can also take at this position here and add other 
uh, sugars, okay? So you can have uh, glycosides here that have the full acetal. So this is the hemiacetal, and that's kind of a, a review of that previous chapter. We looked at aldehydes, remember, chapter 22, I think it was. Reversibility there. We can go back and reform the aldehyde. That's the C1 position. That's where the aldehyde was, okay, at that one position. And these structures get more complicated, right? We've got all these alcohols. How many alcohols? We've got five alcohols here. Uh, three, four stereocenters, and then a fifth stereocenter here once it cyclizes to the hemiacetal. But it is reversible. Once we form the full acetal, though, uh, the acetals are stable to neutral water and to base, okay? So if you're around neutral pH 7 or, or higher there, these full acetals are stable. But this is reversible if you treat it with water and what? Acid. Okay. And we showed you the mechanism of that going back, so we'll have to review that. But that's the basic structure here to make the polycarbohydrates, the disaccharides, as we'll see, if this is another sugar. Okay, And it can just keep polymerizing on to form the polyacetal there. So these are ether linkages there that are stable to neutral water and base. But if you protonate, you know, these are... Uh, basic enough to be protonated by strong acid, and then you can hydrolyze a backwards. So that's kind of the key thing to, uh, to keep track of that. Anyway, the basics of the structure and the overall thing. Let's get to the different families of sugars and go through some of these uh, sequentially here. So we've got the uh, aldoses, and uh, let's see the number of carbons, aldose, means it's an aldehyde, and that's at the C1 position there. Ketoses are ketones. Uh, let's look at the simplest one here, glyceraldehyde. And we call this D, uh, glyceraldehyde, and it does have an optic rotation that's dextrorotatory. I won't draw out the whole thing, <laughs> glyceraldehyde. So it has an aldehyde here, and then the Fischer projection, this is coming out at you. So what would that look like then if we tip it on its side there and look at the top? You see the stereocenter is what? Let's see, top priority for that stereocenter, top priority is this carbon-carbon, so the oxygen. This one's doubly bonded here, so that's the second priority. And then three, yeah, so that's a review of that. That's what indeed the R stereocenter. And this is called D-glyceraldehyde, not because it's dextrorotatory. <laughs> the D actually means what? That this last stereocenter is on the right side. And that kind of comes out of Fisher's analysis, and we'll see uh, what he meant there. He noticed some of the earlier simple sugars from nature were dextrorotatory, so the D kind of persisted there. And he's just doing the relative stereochemical arrangement when we get to the higher sugars you'll see there. But what do we call this one? Glyceraldehyde, a specific name. What family? It's in the aldoses. And which aldose is it? Right, it's a triose. Okay, it's really <laughs> the only one, I guess. Well, you could call dihydroxyacetone also a triose. We'll see that uh, later on. But uh, the triose aldose uh, would be deglyceraldehyde. De L, we can draw L. It would have the, the alcohol on this side, and it would have what? The S stereocenter there, okay? So let's see, how about um, a uh, tetros now? Let's get up to that one. What would be our uh, tetros? We'd have uh, four carbons. And we can have the two stereocenters together here on the right. This is still a D uh, series sugar. This is uh, D erythrose. And we can also have uh, this one here, which is also a D sugar. This is uh, 3 -os. Okay. Okay, erythrose and 3 -os. 
Now, those are two I don't expect you to know, but you, you should be able to see by the number of carbons that it's indeed a tetros and it's still an aldose. And because this last stereo center is to the right, it's a D uh, erythros. L erythros, could we draw that? Yeah, the L erythros would look like this. It had that same four carbon unit, but the two stereo centers here would be on the other side. Okay, this one would be S. Okay, comes from an old name which means erythros are together and threos across. Um, and you can kind of see the the relative uh, stereochemistry there. Let's see. I'm going to summarize the reactions for you. We can go back and look at the pentoses and the hexoses for a second, but I like to summarize the reactions early on too here. We already mentioned the hemiacetal and the acetal form. Well, if you've got a sugar, and we'll just stick with glyceraldehyde for now, what can we do with this? Well, we can take sodium borohydride, okay? <laughs> and it's got an aldehyde, right? So it can make the glycerol, okay? Glycerol or glycerin now, it makes a general type of compound called an aldetol. Uh, and you can make aldetols of any sugar. Now it's what, a primary alcohol at that position. If you took the optical rotation of glycerol, what would you get here? <laughs> the optical rotation here of pure deglyceraldehyde, its rotation is 19 degrees, okay, in the polarimeter because it's a chiral molecule in pure form, have a rotation of plus 19. What would be the rotation here? This rotation would be zero. Why? It's achiral now, right? That's not a stereocenter. It has two same groups. And plus you can see the mere plane relationship there. Okay, So that's a way to, to characterize that. What else could we do here? We could also use hydrogen and palladium and hydrogenate the uh, pi bond there and go to the same type of product. So, you know, those are similar type of reactions uh, that maybe we're familiar with here. You can also take this with nitric acid, uh, HNO3, nitric acid, and you can oxidize it to what's called the aldaric acid, okay? It's not chiral anymore because both the C1 and the carbon at the bottom, the primary alcohol, gets oxidized. You can actually oxidize the central one if you keep blasting it here, <laughs> or if you use chromic acid, a real strong oxidant. But these are the aldaric acids. Okay. You can make aldaric acids of any of the sugars there. You can also take this and partially oxidize it. And this is the demo we're gonna see in a bit. Silver oxide, usually in the presence of ammonia and base. And what this forms is the aldonic acid. And it just is selective for the C1 position. Aldehydes are more susceptible to oxidation. Notice the C3 and all the other alcohols are left behind. Those are the aldonic acids. Now your book also talks about use of uh, copper here and these uh, copper salts in it. This is the Tollens reaction. It's a Tollens test to see if there's a free aldehyde that can be oxidized. Now, if it's an acetal anomeric carbon, it won't be positive for the Tollens test. And we can easily see this because the byproduct will be silver zero, uh, which is the reduced form of the metal. And that gives a silver mirror on the glassware. You can also use uh, another set of reagents here, bromine and water, to do the uh, same uh, type of oxidation. Um, another reaction with carbs is uh, with uh, the cyanohydrin reaction. So let's look at that. So you can take that same uh, monosaccharide, glyceraldehyde, or any of the other monosaccharides we're gonna look at, sodium cyanide, and and what uh, dilute acid here, and you can get the four carbon species now. Now the cyanohydrin forms here, and notice we add another carbon onto the chain. Now there's ways to convert that cyanohydrin, the cyano group, onto a new sugar, 
Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that. And if we have a trios, this is a way to use the cyanohydrin to go to the tetrose. And if we started with a tetrose, it goes to a pentose. And you'll, you'll see those reactions uh, coming up here in a second. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good summary of the key reactions. So let's look at uh, maybe a couple others here. Here's glucose in its cyclic form. We've got the equatorial positions. And let's say we've got the, the down one right now. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of jumping ahead there. We'll, we'll look at how, how we get to this. But this is in equilibrium with what? The free aldehyde at that position, right? Then you've got all the other stuff on the molecule, including, you know, uh, all these alcohols. I'm not going to draw them all. But if you've in equilibrium here and you've got the hemiacetal, you can then do reactions on the free aldehyde. So uh, a lot of these reactions that we'll look at, it's like with the silver oxide, with the silver mirror and base here, you can then oxidize that to the uh, to the aldonic acid, and you can see the silver precipitate out, okay, and it gives the oxidized form there. You don't see the, the oxidized sugar in the solution. What you see is the silver here. And we say that the sugar then, if it's a hemiacetal, is a reducing sugar, okay? So there's a reaction with, uh, with the more uh, complex thing there. Let's look at a couple other reactions with glucose so far. You can take it with methyl iodide and also with silver as a base here, excess methyl iodide. And what you get here is methylation of all the other positions. All the alcohols undergo methyl ether formation. So these are all methyl groups then on there, okay? So you can form the polymethylated version of a sugar. And this is now a full acetal at that position. We'll see we can selectively hydrolyze that acetal and leave all the other ethers behind. So we're kind of combining some of the reactions we already knew. So here's the base taking off a proton and then the nucleophile adding here. It's really just an SM2 type reaction, but at a lot of different places there on the complexing. We can also form the polyacetate if we have excess acetic anhydride and pyridine, okay? So the polyacetate, if you form the polyacetate of cellulose, that's uh, rayon fibers. So there's a lot of applications of those biological fibers, but yeah, so I think summarizes a few more of the reactions, cyanohydrin and how we're gonna look at that. So what I'd like to do now is kind of go through the series and show you how to use some of these reactions and build up the different simple sugars. Okay, so we're gonna start with glyceraldehyde. And I'm gonna show you how Emil Fischer uh, won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so stay tuned for this. And his goal was to determine the structures of these molecules, these sugars. So they were able to isolate these out of a lot of sources in nature. And they had the polarimeter, the optical rotation, uh, Louis Pasteur developed in the 1800s. It goes way back, polarimetry. Uh, they had the different uh, uh, quartz filters that could polarize, plain polarized light. And they could observe the rotations. You know, if a molecule is chiral, it rotated one way. The opposite in antimer rotates this to the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. So this is a topic from 351. But we'll give you this data and we'll talk about this. So this is deglyceraldehyde. The optical rotation is uh, plus 19, okay? The uh, L form shown here is what? Minus 19, okay? So this one was in nature. So uh, Fisher actually uses this one to go forward in his reaction. So he takes this one with a pure D form with sodium cyanide, okay, and HCl. And that forms uh, the cyanohydrin. So here we have the OH and the cyano group. 
doesn't matter which side you draw it on. In fact, you can draw this as a squiggle here. It's kind of a mixture at that point. And then what he does is he takes uh, palladium, and he had to use palladium on barium sulfate. So that's a formation of the Linlar catalyst. Remember, we had Linlar for partial hydrogenation of what, alkynes before? And yeah, hydrogenation. And that will form the uh, imine, okay? And then the imine, he puts in water and acid, okay? Why is he doing that? Well, he's hydrolyzing the imine, and he gets two products here. One is this. And I just showed you this molecule, right? <laughs> What's that? That's erythros, <laughs> okay? And he also got uh, out of this uh, threos, which is this one, okay? So erythros and threos both come out of this reaction. What's the relationship between erythros and threos coming out of this reaction? This stereocenter is fixed, right? This is from D glyceraldehyde, okay? The new stereocenter is right there, and it's either to the right or to the left, right? It's a mixture there, but this stereocenter is the same, right? What's the relationship between erythros and threos? Yeah, they're diastereomers of each other. He was able to crystallize these two and separate them, okay? Why can you separate them? Well, diastereomers have different physical properties. They're not an antimers, and antimers have all the same physical properties, melting point, boiling point, whatever. But diastereomers now have what? Different physical properties. So he's able to crystallize these two things apart, and he took the optical rotation of erythros, and the optical rotation here is 9.3, and the optical rotation of 3Os, okay, get this, it's 12 minus 12.5, <laughs> okay, degrees in the polarimeter. Minus, that should be an L sugar down, right? No, <laughs> this is lever rotatory, that's the little L. This is still dextro rotatory, the plus there. But this is still a D sugar, why? Because this last stereocenter on 3Os coming from D glyceraldehyde is still to the right, that's still the D series, okay? This is still D erythros. This is still D erythro, D3 S there. Optical rotations, plus 9.3, minus 12.5. What do you learn from that? You don't learn anything. <laughs> so how did Fisher be able to tell the relative stereochemistry between erythros and 3 S? Ah, it's the next reaction. So let's see. And yeah, we'll have to kind of have two boards up here. Let's see. Well, well, we'll refer back to this one in a second, but let me draw the new thing here. So we take erythros, and we're going to treat that now with uh, nickel and hydrogen. And, you know, different metals can catalyze hydrogenation reactions, but if we have erythros, we're going to hydrogenate it to the erythritol, it's called, which is the aldatol, right? And remember, erythros had the two stereocenters both on the right side. That was an aldehyde, but after we hydrogenate it, we get the aldatol, right? And we're going to take 3-O's. Uh, remember, coming out of that reaction, do the same thing, nickel and hydrogen. And what do we get? We get out this. Okay, that's the aldatol that corresponds to erythros. Now... Take the optic rotation again. And this is the key thing of the Fisher proof of the stereochemistry. The stereochemistry of erythros must have been right, right. Why? Because when the aldatol is formed, what's the optic rotation now? This molecule? Yeah. It's what? This is an R stereocenter. That's an S stereocenter. And you see what? The near plane relationship. This is what? An A chiral meso compound, right? What's the optic rotation of a meso compound that's a chiral? Right, zero. So erythritol, having the two stereocenters here on the right, has this uh, symmetry in it, and the optic rotation is zero. What's the optic rotation of 3-os? 3 atoll, sorry, it's in the reduced form. Well, this is our, our stereocenter. There's no mere plane relationship here. So when they took the optic rotation of that, it's also 
leave for rotatory, minus 37 degrees. And what? That proves that the stereochemistry of 3S must have been left, right, okay? Whereas erythros had to be right, right, okay? And I think that's genius. <laughs> That's why he won the Nobel Prize. He figured out the relative structures. He didn't know whether this stereo center was absolutely to the right or to the left. He kind of guessed, but he knew relative to this stereo center, this one had to be on that same side of that projection due to the uh, symmetry relationship. Anyway, that's the basics of it. Uh, we could go through the series here and show you how uh, erythros is converted into ribose and arabinose, and then doing the same trick with the optical rotation thing. There you'd have to take erythros and do the cyanohydrin again, the reduction, uh, and then hydrogenate the two new uh, carbohydrates, and then do the optical rotation thing again. Fisher did that through the whole series of all the naturally occurring sugars to nail down this relationship. And it was always with the aldatols, looking at the reduced form and whether they were chiral or not. Okay, so the ones all on the same side, or the ones that have a symmetry element, will be uh, will be uh, useful to prove what that relative stereochemistry is. So yeah, I don't think I'll go through the rest of the series there. <laughs> we don't really have uh, have time to do that, but but it's important to uh, to keep that straight. Okay, uh, last topic here for the first uh, hour is going to be looking at the uh, cyclic form. Of, uh, of, of glucose and using the models to figure this out. And this is an important process to go through. And you really need to go through this physically with models and see this. Some people have trouble seeing things in three dimensions and we're drawing, you know, these Fisher projections and the stereo centers and trying to keep track of them. But you're gonna have to do this uh, with the models yourself and keep track of that. So glucose, the pattern here on the Fisher projection is right, left, right, right. And don't forget about this last alcohol. It's not a stereocenter, it's primary there. All four of these in the open form is that. Well, this is only 1% in the open form of D-glucose. The main form is this, which has this relationship, there's all the stereo centers, and then the new stereo center, alpha plus beta. Beta is equatorial there, and everything else is the same. And you already noticed something about glucose here. If you remember your cyclohexane chairs, and we were reviewing that, all these stereo centers here, 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 and here are all what? Equatorial, except this one. This one, OH group in the hemiacetal is axial, okay? And look at the beta form here uh, with this new stereocenter in the hemiacetal. Equatorial, 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 all equatorial, okay? Okay, so there might be some understanding there of why nature has picked glucose to be the most abundant monosaccharide on Earth. In fact, you can estimate the, the amount of carbon in the biosphere and how much is tied up as glucose in plants, whatever. And of course, in animals, we have a lot of polyglucose too, not only from the diet, but we store polyglucose as glycogen also in the body, which is similar to starch in plants. So it's over 98% of all carbon in the biosphere is tied up in this molecule of glucose, which is kind of important there. And you can see why maybe. It's all equatorial and it's a six-membered ring, which is strain-free there. And it's ready to be fully oxidized to liberate the energy in those bonds. But it's water-soluble enough, right? It's got all those hydroxyls on there. So that's a good thing. How do we go from here to here? And how do we keep track of that? First, orient yourself. This edge here in the cyclic form is coming out at you, okay? And we always keep the oxygen of the pyran. And that's what a six-membered ring with an ether oxygen is. It's a pyran heterocycle. We always have that in the upper right. Okay, and the D series always has this stereo center up. Okay, so you can see the D relationship there. It's right here, and there's your primary alcohol coming off. It's kind of hard to see uh, see that at first, but uh, yeah. So let's tip this molecule on its side first of all, 
And what do we get? Down, up, down, down, and wherever there. Okay. Now let's rotate around some of these bonds here. And we'll go to the model here in a second so you'll see this a little more clearly. Uh, what are we going to have? We're going to have the aldehyde out here. And you see that one's still down, okay? This one's still up, this one's down. And then this the back, okay? And this uh, alcohol is down right there. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We still have all the carbons now. And we're gonna reorient around here a little bit and we're gonna get this view of it. So this is different conformations, right? These are all the same molecule, keeping track of the stereocentesis down, up, down, down. Well, there they are, down, up, down, down. And the models will be a little more clear, I hope. <laughs> and then we get to this view. So let's have this alcohol right here. You know, we kind of rotated around here. We didn't change that stereo center. It's right there. And we still have these down, up, down. Okay, and now we're going to cyclize on here and grab that hydrogen off there. Okay, so let's see what's the result of that. Okay, well, we'll have this. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of drawing here, sorry. <laughs> And then what? Then we can pucker this thing into the conformation, right? And so it's really the same thing here. We call this the Hayworth uh, conformation. And initially they thought there were these flat uh, six-membered rings, but we know from what SP3 hybridized carbon, it doesn't want to be flat because that bond angle here would be 120 degrees. But if we pucker it, what? This becomes uh, 109.5, which is what you want there. And you see there's this stereo center up right there, okay? And then we have this one right here, which is down. And it kind of helps to draw the hydrogens in here too, if you want to keep track of that. Uh, and then this one right here, OH right there. This one right here, OH there. And then here, this is kind of the key, whether that's going to be down or up, okay? Let's look at the models and we'll take a break here soon. And we'll start reviewing right here uh, next hour. But let's start with the Fisher projection up there. Go through this. Oop. So glucose in its ring open form, where I've got my hand here, my left hand is the aldehyde, double bond. You have to imagine a double bond right there. <laughs> and then let's look at the C2 position here. You see the alcohol. Alcohols, oxygens in red there, is to the right. It's coming out at you. And notice the carbon backbone is kinked down there. And here's the hydrogen coming out on the left right there at C2. C3, the next one down would be right here. And it's to the left, right? And here's your hydrogen here. And then the carbon's kinked down. And then there's C4 position to the left, okay? Hydrogen to the left. I'm sorry, uh, uh, hydroxyl to the right again. And then what about this one? Now this one I, is the five position. I've got the bond that's going to make already on there. So don't, don't consider that yellow bond yet. But you see it's to the right, okay? That's why this is a D sugar in my hand. It's the last stereo center is to the right. And there's the uh, hydrogen coming to the left. And then this one is the primary alcohol on the bottom, okay? That's at the C6 position right here. That's not a stereo center. So we've got the four stereo centers, one, two, three, four. And you know, in solution, conformationally, it's going all over the place, right? <laughs> and so how do we form the pyran? Well, we're gonna take the C5 alcohol right here and use it as a nucleophile to attack the aldehyde right there. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm highlighting the pair of electrons on that alcohol, so that's the yellow, okay. And let's do the reaction and attack the aldehyde and form a new bond there. So now we're a six-membered ring with the uh, 
oxygen there in the ring, the pyran ring. You can see the six ring there. And we just made that bond right there. This is no longer an aldehyde. This is a new alcohol now at that point. And what do you also see? You see the C6 carbon up there. It's a D series. I'm keeping the oxygen in the ring in the upper right position there. And you can see uh, this alcohol here is down right here. This one's up. This one in the back is down. You can see the hydrogens up, down, up there. And this last hydrogen over here is down. So, you know, it's a lot of stereo centers to keep track of here. But which one did we make here? Did we make the alpha or the beta? And we call these two here the anomers in the hemiacetal form. Uh, we've got the new stereocenter, right, where the aldehyde used to be. And let's see, let's put it in two different conformations. What about that conformation? Well, that has all the alcohols and this C6 carbon in what axial position? So that's going to be less stable than this, right? So engage with your model. You need to be able to go from this and understand what those stereocenters are and then go to this. Now, when I draw these things, and in your book too, we keep this position, this conformation. Of course, the molecule can tumble in space. You can draw it however you want. And you can also go back and assign R and S to each stereo center and keep track of it that way. I think it's better to keep track of the, the visualization, the orientation of it. So we've got uh, the uh, C6 position right there. We've got the oxygen right there. And this is the chair. And this is what? This is also equatorial, the new OH at the anomeric carbon. So this is the beta one that I'm showing here, okay? We could also get alpha if we attack that aldehyde on the opposite face, and that's where we'll start here next hour. Um, that would give this anomer, which is now down at that C1 position, okay? So very good. Let's take a break, 10 minutes, and we'll be back with the second hour today. Thank you.